All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, Taylor here, Brett. Uh, man, this is kind of our, our first little venture, uh, our first time ever having a, an orthopedic surgeon on our podcast. And so we couldn't be more excited to have the one, the only Dave King. So uh, David King is a, a hip specialist. I mean, he's basically the hip guy in St. Louis. Uh, we would probably put him up against anybody in, this, in the Midwest. And uh, he is the guy. He was uh, gracious enough to, to speak to our DNSC course today about uh, labral pathology, surgical options for FAI, um, glute mead, tendinopathies, all these types of uh, just awesome stuff. And so uh, we're, we're super thankful that you decided to sit down with us. We're enjoying some uh, dang good champagne. Brett, do you want to intro? Yeah, we got, uh, we got the Krug. Yes. And so uh, it's heard a lot about it. We uh, we finally just uh, decided to, to go for it, and it's uh, it's awesome. So far, so good. Yeah, oh, it's very great. Good. So we've uh, you've seen Dom Periam on this podcast once <laughs> or twice, and uh, so Krug is our next next spot. So, uh, but anyway, so uh, Dave, you uh, you're the managing partner uh, with uh, Motion Orthopedics here in St. Louis. Uh, you went to Emory School uh, in, that's in New York, correct? It's Atlanta. Atlanta, Atlanta I'm sorry, I, pointed, I don't know why I got in New York. And then uh, you did your fellowship under the, the one, the only, uh, Philpon, uh, yeah. for in Hockman, Stedman, Stedman and Yale, um, uh, and Vale. Man, I'm tripping over my words today, my goodness. Uh, but anyway, so uh, maybe take us through your, the start. Like, why did you choose to be an orthopedic surgeon? Uh, how did you get infatuated with the hip, and, and where did that all come from? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. This is awesome. So this is what a what a, what a Saturday. <laughs> Hoping my Georgia Bulldogs will uh, pull through tonight. Oh yeah, that's right. Beat Alabama, win a national championship. It's time. So um, actually, my first kind of love for orthopedics came when I was in Georgia. So I grew up, born in Connecticut, but moved to Atlanta, and I had a rock star. This kid Benji Wood was a uh, country boy who played. I played high school football with, and he. Um, had a lot of shoulder issues and eventually ended up having to get treated by, by Jimmy Andrews. And I, and I met Jimmy in high school at, at a very prime age and just watched him do his thing. And I mean, I was hooked, hooked, absolutely hooked. Um, just the dynamic personality, the way, the way he took a young athlete and, you know, in a horrible situation. I mean, what, what are you, as a young athlete, what are you? You're invincible. Right. All of a sudden you have this period of time where you're like, wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> there can you know things can happen to me and it's a real real issue and then to see him navigate that whole process i mean just a legend so it all it all uh, spiraled from there i had my own orthopedic issues too which helped you know had a big knee injury in high school broke a couple bones that kind of thing so mm-hmm. so uh what brought you to uh mark philippon the hawkins segment like yeah. how did that all transpire yeah so you know it's funny i was coming out of my residency at washu here in st louis in 2006, I was there 2001 to 2006, and arthroscopic hip surgery was really just kind of taking root. Tom Bird in Nashville, and there were some amazing pioneers who who were doing things before, but it was really emerging as an accepted um, specialty, had started having research that was really supporting it. You know, I mean, you gotta have that evidence-based research that supports it so i'm sitting there coming out and and i and i knew i liked sports medicine i liked the you know the whole all aspects of sports medicine in terms of the patients and the psychi- psychology of it the whole thing there but you know i'm coming out and i'm sitting there one day and, I, and how often does a new field emerge like it's unbelievable it's yeah. like you know i mean can you imagine if you're around like when we first did our first acl or first joint replacement i'm actually coming out of out of it and this is a brand new field and i didn't even know if i liked it but i said I got to be on this. So Philippon, I originally was either going to go to Chicago or New York for my fellowship. And then Philippon would move from, from the East Coast to Vail. And I was like, this is, this is it. This is the time. So, so I actually went to Vail. Um, originally, I was supposed to work four months with him. But a couple of my co-fellows needed to trade months. They weren't going to do much hip arthroscopy. So I ended up getting a full six months with him out there. And I mean, it was unbelievable. So the guy is just <clears throat> some of the greatest humans, <laughs> French Canadian, one of the greatest humans and, and great technician, great with people. So. so would you give him the credit? Was he the first one to, to basically, you know, everything we know now with uh, fibromyalgia, impingement and labral repair, 
do we give him the credit or was there someone before him that was speaking of it and talking about it or yeah so so it's great you know it's it's very common i think in in our world to have sort of the the stalwart academic crew you know and professor gans and from from europe was one who really figured out fai then you had you know tom bird in nashville and you had a lot of people that were very sort of rigid like let's the evidence has to come out and then we support it Philippon, though, who's evidence-based guy collecting re- data all the time, pushed the boundaries. You know, you somebody's got to try that next move. You know, I mean, you wait, you got you you're, do no harm, take care of your patient, but you got to push it to the next push level. You know, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, the the total joint replacement guy said the the arthroscope is the instrument of the devil for the hip. <laughs> now it's now it's the gold right. standard. Yeah, it's gold standard. You know, why well, wouldn't be? But so everybody's going to be. And you need both sides, right? Mm-hmm. You need you need the you need the hardcore base to to make sure that nobody's running wild out there. But you got to have some pioneers out there. Mm-hmm. So I look at those. My favorite two guys in the in the world were were Tom Bird in Nashville, just great human, and then Philippon. I think those two guys are great. Mm-hmm. Right. So then you know, for those of us who are you know seeing hip patients and stuff like that, like how big of a problem is fem- femoral tibia impingement, labral, you know. How- what is the, how big of an issue are we, are we talking about here? Yeah. So first and foremost, <laughs> um, in my world, the number one issue is overuse and abuse, right? So, so FAI will, you know, it's important. And when they get to me and they need surgery, it's important, but, the, but continuing to be diligent with our young athletes on protecting them. Right. So I look I look a lot today, dance, competitive cheer, those kind of things. Those are what Little League Baseball was in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, throwing people's arms out, throwing people's arm out, you know, 20 hours a week of dancing and that kind of stuff there. So, you know, I I really think it's twofold. So there's, yes, FAI is really important. Label tears are really important, but making sure we're protecting the people from, from doing too much or over abusing themselves. But that wasn't the question. The question was about FAI. So... We're just we're we're learning more and more about it, but the concept of actually having a a bony change contributing to all these other secondary problems, it's it's unique. You know, we don't see that a lot. I guess we have impingement in the shoulder, and we have certain things where you have that, but it's just a unique situation where you have a seemingly not so big an issue in the bone, but over years and decades can cause a lot of problems. Yeah, we talked there, or you talked this morning about there's kind of different, a couple ways to get there. One would be, of course, you have a genetic component. We have, um, you know, in-range rotational sports with, you know, the growth plates open. Um, And then we have, uh, you know, just development. So developmental errors or, you know, we didn't go through the right developmental sequence. So... Of those three things, I think you said the, this morning, or of those three, what do you think is the main contributing factor to the CAM effect that we see on the, the femoral side of the... Uh... Yeah, so I think I think at some point we'll figure out that there is a genetic propensity, but then I think it's their activities. You mm-hmm. know, when you, when you see it in specific sports, when you see such a high prevalence in ice hockey, and you know how early you have to start skating to become an elite level hockey player... Mm-hmm. The, it just it just fits, you know, and it makes sense if you think about it. The growth plate is the weak part for any limb or growing limb. You know, you're going to stress that your body's going to make more bone to try to protect that. It, it was beneficial when your growth plates are open, but all of a sudden becomes a uh oh, not so great after the fact. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of a fascinating thing that you alluded to today was it's kind of actually the body's response to try to help the situation. Mm-hmm. Call it Wolf's Law, call it Peter Volkman's Law, whatever it is, but that was actually a response of the body to try to stabilize it or just try to make that situ- situation better at the time, and then later on that, that becomes a problem. Yeah, yeah. And someone asked a question, I thought this was a really good point, because people think with their last type of impingement that you do the procedure and then in five years it comes back. But because of the growth plate issue, then that's not really the case. Yes, right. And bone, I mean, the rule of thumb is bone, if you stress bone, bone either stays healthy or makes more bone. Bone loves to be stressed, right? So if you're stressing this area of the hip when the growth plate's open, it makes more bone. Growth plate's done. There's no reason to make more bone in that area. 
In fact, the cam bumps don't grow over time, right? If they're being, they should grow over time. But once you remove that and you're not seeing the stress in that area, the bone has no reason to make more bone. Right. right? So it just, it, 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 the, the new shape of it after their growth plates are closed is what it is. We, we didn't talk about it today, but one of, the, one of the hard things that we deal with are those labral tears that are debilitating enough, meaning not only just affecting their athletic ac activities, but can't sit <coughs> in a class, you know, can't do normal physical activities. You're forced to operate on their labrum, but their growth plates are open and they have a cam and we can't remove those. So right now, right now, that's actually one of the hardest populations is, is and, and I actually just had one a couple of weeks ago who I fixed their labrum when they were 13 because they were, they failed everything. I mean, mm -hmm. it was debilitating. The, the parents were literally like this, my, they can't sit through class. Like they're squirming, standing in the back, all this stuff. Had to fix the labrum. Decent sized cam, but growth plates open. So we had to, and I just came back. Patients now 19 or 20 years old and starting to have some symptoms again and just said, hey, you know what? I don't want to go, I don't want to re-tear my labrum fully. I just, I, I want to get this resolved. And so went in and got rid of the cam now. What's the prevalence of labral pathology without femoral acetabular impingement? <laughs> So that's when I was alluding to the overuse type stuff. Uh -huh. So um, I don't have a statistic. You know, we don't. We, in order to do these population-based studies, you have to X-ray all these people to get their, you know, to test them. Who's going to take their, you know, daughter and X-ray their pelvis over and over again every six months? So we don't have that great statistic there. But we're seeing more and more labral tears without impingement or dysplasia, and. And the, the thought is it's related to either some micro instability or overuse. Mm. You know, you're fatiguing these structures, these soft tissues. You know, everything you guys are doing is trying to stabilize, right? It's all about stable, stabilizing for functional movements. Well, you get somebody who's dancing 20 hours a week and they're just, no matter how hard you try, you're going to fatigue. You're mm -hmm. going to, you're just not going to protect that joint. That joint's moving. It's micro motion. You tear that labrum. You know, and those are the hardest ones, you know, when I'm sitting there looking at a family who's, who's, who's there for a surgery because they failed everything else. And I don't, I can't guarantee that we have an etiology that we can fix mm -hmm. when they have a big cam bump. Great. I'm going to get rid of the cam bump, get back to life. You're good. Mm -hmm. This is gone. When it, when it's that overuse micro instability, it's awful. Cause you're like, well, what do you want to do? I want to go back and dance. I want to go back and cheer. I want to go do all these things. I want to go to college and do it. And uh, so those are the tough ones. But we're seeing more and more of them. I think it's because we're, we're just doing too much with kids. So let's go all philosophical here. <laughs> so if you had somebody who you knew had uh, femoralized type of impingement, maybe they didn't have symptoms, um, would you ever prophylactically go in in an attempt? Because you know that's heading toward a labral tear. So, you know, I'm sure you've thought long and hard about this. Like, what do you, uh, cause you told a story today about a hockey goalie that they literally, because of their cam defect, were not able to cover up their five hole because they just didn't have the hip internal rotation. So sounds like there's a little bit of a performance component that could be involved. And I know it's like a difficult topic, but what would you say to that? Yeah. So that, that is, that's kind of the, that's the one that keeps me up at night. You know, that's the one that really burns a lot of brain cells on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there aren't that many brain cells left. <laughs> and hopefully, after today, there's a few left. Yeah, just a couple. But yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we talked about it today a little bit. Um, I'll answer the question as if somebody really has no symptoms, right? They have a little performance-based motion issue. They have no pain, no symptoms there, but they have cam. They have real cam. So, to knowing what we know today. It, I will MRI that individual specifically non arthrogram, specifically looking at a cartilage sequence, right? So our radiologist Tate credits are the best in the business. Unbelievable. He's a professor with hospital for special surgery. He reads for New York. He reads for St. Louis. He's amazing, but he has cartilage sequences that he's developed with his, the guys in HSS um, to really look at that acetabular rim cartilage, you know, and if somebody has cam, and their cartilage is pristine, then we're gonna we're gonna do everything functional we can to get mm -hmm. them better without operating on them. You know, um, you have some performance-based functional deficits. You're starting to wear that acetabular rim cartilage. 
then we're then I hate the term aggressive, but I'm more aggressive, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think they're going to get twofold benefit. They're going to get the performance plus yeah. some cartilage protection. Mm-hmm. What does the hierarchy of imaging look like for those of us who are kind of out in the wild yeah. treating this? Like what you know, we're having a difficult case. We're suspecting it's everything we're talking about. What would you expect us to order? What would you want us to order? It's I was telling you earlier, like it. You know, it was so sexy to order the arthrogram 10 years ago. Now it's almost like backlash to where like it's now it sounds like it's a mistake to order the arthrogram. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your comments on all yeah. that? What, what's the appropriate test? So the the dirty secret that nobody wants to talk about is <clears throat> is the state of the MRIs, right? Mm-hmm. So um, if you have a older generation MRI that's that's seen some years, doesn't have the, the, the power, the magnet power, doesn't have the right software system, all these kind of things... Arthrograms necessary for that, right? Mm-hmm. To get the detail to see about the labral tear. You is one point five Tesla kind of what we're? Er- so one point five is, but not, they're not all the same. Yeah, you know? yeah. So they're not all the same. But what 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 year yeah. they are? What sequence packages? What coils you're using around the limbs? All these things are big issues there. But the general rule of thumb, I think, would be: when in doubt, currently order an arthrogram if you're real if you're really high suspicion for it for a labral tear. Um. If you have, if you've made relationships and you've developed relationships with radiologists and imaging centers that are very comfortable with their sequencing to not do dye and not do arthrograms, then avoid the dye, you know, so mm-hmm. we're, we're getting to that point. The, the key though, I think though, is that there are a percentage that are missed no matter what test you get, you know, so between 15 and, excuse me, between, between, <laughs> too many bubbles, he's back, sorry, <laughs> I'm back, you know, move on. Uh, so between... 10, 15, 20%, there's some different studies out there, but of, of labral tears can be missed on the imaging. So I wouldn't, you know, I don't want people to be overly stressed about that, but get to know where you're ordering your tests, mm-hmm. you know, and get to know what they're looking for and, and your suspicions. Is there a place for plain view x-ray for... <laughs> Everybody has to have plain view x-ray. Okay. Because the bone, the, the bony morphology, the, the bone, whether it's your whether it's your socket position or your or your femoral head neck junction, that drives everything. Because there's a thought that it's kind of like a money grab in the orthopedic world, that you're just ordering a bunch of x-rays that are not giving you more information. But I think what I hear you saying is that you actually are putting merit into the plain view x-ray, even if you are knowing that you're gonna get an MRI down the road. 100%. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, x-rays. Hundred bucks, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? It's not a money grab, mm-hmm. right? Ten, I mean, uh, trust me, as a as a guy that owns their <coughs> business and knows all this, I mean, by the time you pay your your tech, it, it's it's not a money grab, right? Sure, it's it's for a purpose, you know. So, so then, especially um, in the hip. Mm-hmm. So the reason you, you said uh, what what plain view X rays do you take merit in? Yeah, for the hip. So yeah. AP pelvis. Uh-huh. So you have to get a you got you have to you want to see both sides. Yep. So an AP pelvis is going to show you. <coughs> It's going to show you both sides. It's going to show you the socket. You got to make sure you get a good one that's based on your tech. I get a frog lateral or a done lateral. So that's where you, where it's, it's basically some flexion and rotation. Mm-hmm. So you're going to see the cam mostly in that anterior superior aspect of the femoral head neck junction. So you got to get that done view. You know, cross table laterals, um, we used to get them all the time. Mm-hmm. I think you, I pick and choose when I want a cross table lateral. If somebody has a massive cam bump, I might get a cross table lateral, but if somebody has a massive cam bump, I'm going to get a CT scan with 3D reconstructions to really map that whole cam lesion. So, sure. so two, so you can get away with you can get away with a two view hip, AP pelvis, AP pelvis. Frog leg. Yep. Yeah. yep, perfect. We talked uh, today. You were talking about the importance <clears throat> of like the uh, antiversion angles and uh, and the, those mensuration measurements. So. As far as imaging goes, how do you, is it important for you to know what the angle of antiversion is or, you know, how do you yeah. go about getting that? So th- this is a, this is a point where I think old school physical exam is really important, mm-hmm. right? So, um, taking someone and going to look at their range of motion, their, their internal and external rotation, a prone position so that their, their legs in neutral extension flexion, it's supported. And then testing, you know, bending their knee and testing internal and external rotation. You know, if those are in, with your clinical experience, if those are in a reasonable range, then I don't think imaging is important. Right. If you have an extreme external rotation and nothing on internal rotation, that might indicate you have some relative retroversion. Really important. 
Right. Especially if somebody if somebody has a labral tear, they're failing non-surgical, they're, they're, they're going down this surgical path, and you see that, that's very important because that's been clearly shown. If you have significant retroversion or relative retroversion, um, that's going to limit your ability to respond to the surgery. Mm-hmm. So. And uh, Dave did a demo in... Uh, uh, in the seminar this morning, basically he did a modified hip. So in case you're wondering, it was basically the, the patient was laying uh, prone, knee was flexing 90 degrees, and it was nothing fancy. It was, and that, that's basically what, what we do also. Nothing, nothing fancy, but it's but it's so important. Clinical goal. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And, and it's yeah. and it's been shown in our world, in our ortho world, we correlated that with the with the CT findings of actual version, and that was really mm. it correlated very well. So mm-hmm. so old school basic. And I apologize that I don't I don't know the names of the tests. I'm just <laughs> yeah, no, you, tell, you're call good. it what it is. <laughs> well, it's interesting too. You said you opened up your lecture saying one of the most important tests that you do is a favor, which surprised me a little bit because in femoral acetabular impingement we're so used to checking flexion, internal rotation, and adduction. And you rolled out and said that, and I was kind of curious. Uh, could you comment on? Yeah. What? So we don't know. We're we're not sure what it is. Is it? Is there a? Is there a thickening or a stiffening of the anterior fibers of one of the iliofemoral ligaments, or is there an effusion? So the biggest thing is: is there a joint effusion? What limits it? So what I was talking about today was was that <clears throat> if you're looking at is this a joint issue or outside of the joint, that a a loss of motion in the favor position. What well, I don't care whether you hurt or not, but if you're actually losing motion asymmetric to your other side, that 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 correlates pretty highly with there being a joint related issue. Right. I think it's a combination of, I think it's really an effusion mm. to be honest, because a lot of times it will then do a diagnostic. I'll throw an ultrasound and you'll see this kind of big, thick, irritated joint where the capsules elevated because of fluid in the joint. The difference is, you know, I mean the hip, we can't tell if you're swollen, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah. your knee, you can blot it everywhere else. You can blot it, but you can't there. So I don't really, I don't think really people know why the favor is, but I think it's a combination maybe of swelling plus the iliofemoral ligament being irritated. I think you made a great point on the diagnostic injection too oh, today. Oh, that was huge. I, I yeah. think I, I just uh, can you comment on that? Yeah. I mean, you, I think yeah. that is such a uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's like it's like somebody. <laughs> it's like you, you're given the most difficult situation, and you're given some a gem. So, so what I talked about today was um, figuring out is this a hip joint or is it not a hip joint issue? People can come in with all sorts of different combination of, of complaints groin pain lateral hip glute down the thigh up the back what's related to my label i've got a labral tear is this my labral tear so so for the diagnostic injection we tell you to whatever you got to do to make this thing angry go do it do lunges in the parking lot go for a jog bring some weights and lift them and then you we come in and we do a literally a numbing medication lidocaine and marcaine injection into the hip joint and we we know instantaneously if this is coming from the hip and and that has just been a game changer for figuring this stuff out. Not only for us, but for the patient. You know, patients sitting there and they're questioning. They're like, is this labral tear causing all these symptoms? Because they're all over the place. We go, let me give you a temporary, let's take your labrum, labral tear out of the equation and let you feel your body. Mm. You take it away and they go, we talked about it today. They go, tearful because it's gone. They're like, this is it. That's it. You know, the other patient goes, well, yeah, this, this, and this, that was my labral tear, but it didn't fix this. And then the other patients go, yeah, that got rid of my groin pain, but that's not what's limiting me. Mm. It's these other things, you know, and the ability to, to, to let a patient experience for two hours, what's life like with my labrum numb? Mm. The clarity at that point, you know, it really, the algorithm, <laughs> it's, it, just, it, it just, it just gets very linear. Well, for you point. and the patient. Yeah. I mean, for yeah. you, I mean, that has you to be. You, you, you're, you're just kind of sitting back going, I'm not telling you, you know, because they, do I need the surgery? That's the, that's the question for right. me. Hey doc, do I, do I need the surgery? <laughs> What's the classic textbook pain referral pattern that you see? Yeah. I'm assuming that the. I mean, that we never have symptoms going back up to the spine and things like that. So, like, what would make it, for the people that are listening to this, what makes it easy when they come in? What's classic yeah. for everything we're talking about? So, the classic is the reverse C sign. I don't know if you can. Yeah. So, and, but it happens. I mean, I know, I know a lot of things in textbooks are coming. Yeah, but that's actually laughing. a thing. It's legitimate. They, you know, where's your pain? 
it's here, you know, they're, they're rotating back and forth because they're like, it's here, but it, then it slides to here. So, yeah. And, and for me, if I see it more and more, which is surprising, I don't know why, but, you know, if you don't have groin pain, if you don't have anterior groin pain with sitting and getting it out of a car or rotating, you know, my radar is pretty low for being a labrum. Mm. However, well, we have a joke in my world, and I hope none of my patients see this, <laughs> really, but we have a joke in my world. Anybody who tells me they have a high pain tolerance... Oh, <laughs> no, we... Yeah, we yeah, have yeah, the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. You ain't, gonna, <laughs> you ain't got a high pain tolerance. Or be I don't mean to be a whatever. You're about to yeah, be that. Yeah. 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 But, but I am seeing... I, I do see that... I, I see one of my favorites. This is my... I can, I can make this comment without hate because this is my wife. And I, and I love and married her and all this stuff there. But, but my, like, hardcore... I'm 46, so my hardcore middle-aged, you know, 35 to 45-year-old mom who's ripped, who manages all their daily life stress with their workouts and everything like that, a lot of them have a wicked high pain tolerance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, yes. are, they are putting up with it because they don't want to stop what they're doing, mm-hmm. and they don't want a surgery, and they just want to keep going, and, and um, you know, so a lot of those times they downplay their symptoms, you know, so... Yeah. So that's the I just uh, I noticed got, the exact. Yeah, if, I, yeah. if I had across the board, the, the patient I just had yesterday, she would she should be here with us because she is the closer <laughs> child. But I mean, she fought this thing tooth tooth and nail. Had been through everything you could do, you know. And finally, we did the diagnostic. We're like, listen, I'm not I'm not doing this anymore. Go get your hip pissed and come on back here, you know. And sure enough, she you know she called me back the next day and she's like, that was it. She's like, I, I haven't been able to sit in the bleachers and watch my daughter play volleyball in two seasons mm. like I just I have to walk I have to pace because right. it, it's okay if I'm moving if I'm active enough I'm cool but if I'm just like static sitting sleeping all this stuff there you know now at that and point she, and, she, that... And, she, and she's like she's like I sat for the first time in two years I sat through a game didn't even think about getting up because it was gone mm. does that mean then that she is gonna that we automatically do surgery I, obviously it tells you that's the, the oh. pain generator but what's the what does that mean to you when so, they... so if she had failed Everything. Two and a half years of everything you can imagine. Right. You know what I mean? Any, you know what I mean, she's she seen three different chiropractic specialists who are all three are badasses. She'd been to, I sent her to my favorite hip physical therapist, got nowhere. You know, I mean, she'd been through everything. You, yeah, you sure. Know, shut down her, shut down her running and her hip workouts for, I mean, she'd done it all. Right. And she knew it. You know, yeah, she would. She would not have been in my office. She's at the end of her rope. It yep. was it. Month, she had a big label tear. I mean, there was no, there was no issue on what was going on there. She just had to get there, and she needed to see her life without pain. And it was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> That's a perfect segue into you know we've learned with the disc of the spine, the labrum of the shoulder, the meniscus of the knee that sometimes the bigger the findings on MRI doesn't necessarily. You know, it's not a gateway to surgery. So. Is that kind of the same in the hip, would you say? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's it's just every time I try to predict. So first of all, an MRI is not great at sizing. Everybody asks, how big is my tear? So they always say, how big is my tear? And the, the MRI is not great at sizing the tear because the plane of the socket, you, you take three planes with your MRI, but they don't act, they're not in plane with the, the socket. So you can't measure the tear there. You just you catch it in these frames, you lose it in these frames, and stuff like that. But so I always kind of go into the MRI. I mean, sometimes you can see monster ones, but I always go into the surgery, and I'm kind of like, what are we going to see here? You know? And you'll see partial cartilage labral separations with a little micro motion, maybe some hemorrhagic changes from neovascularization or something. A little wave sound the cartilage, and you're like. This ain't that big a deal, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to stabilize it. I'm going to do what I do. And the patient was really limited. And then they have a, you know, they do great. And they they weren't wimps. They just had a lot of pain. Mm. And then you'll see these monster tears. And somebody who finishes a full season of their sport, and they're like, yeah, I think it's time to get this thing fixed. And you get in there, you're like, I don't know how you're walking. Like it looks, <laughs> yeah. it looks so beat up and painful. How are you even walking? So, man, I can't predict it at all right so there is no real prediction no. i've heard uh thomas bird before say that um you know his most difficult case is like when he's dealing with cartilage issues like on the femoral head versus like the labral thing so 
I mean, how do you how do like how do you differentiate all that, and how yeah. do you know what's what? Yeah. So, so in the knee, we talk about kissing lesions. You know, you can you can have pretty significant wear on one side, the femur or the tibia, and if the other side's pristine, you do pretty well, right? If you have them on the if you have them in the same area as kissing together, they're they're bad. Right. Femoral hip, hips different. There are a lot of acetabular rim cartilage injuries that you can put up with, have no symptoms from. You remove their cam impingement and they still have this cartilage deficit at the rim and they do fine. Femoral sided stuff is a nightmare. Mm. So the next, I, mean, I think if you, if, you, if you talk to the cutting edge guys, you know, I have a lot of colleagues around the country. There, there's usually, every city usually has a couple guys sure. that are pretty big into this and it's their passion. You know, my colleagues around the country, I mean, femoral head cartilage pathology is really what we're trying to figure out next. Right. Mm. How do you do it? How do you, you know, I mean, and and I don't have the right answer for it. You know, we, it's very rare, though, without dislocations, it's pretty rare that you see isolated stuff. You know, um, you, you see a lot of, if they have some acetabular stuff, they'll have sort of global loss in the femoral head. So then like if you're like in a femoral acetabular impingement or a cam lesion, you're reshaping the head of the femur, how do you reconcile the cartilage? Like what's the, I mean. Oh, so you you really shouldn't be taking weight bearing articular cartilage out. It's just the, the cam, cam lesion. Yeah, yeah. the cam, cam should always be at the extremes there. Um, now you will see, you will see those, the cartilage at, and, and it's crazy how many times you need to come. I, 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 got I it, wish got I could. Do, I need to do a live feed at some point. I, I have a couple. Can of patients we do it for would, our? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually, actually have a couple of patients that would love to consent for it and would be. Fine oh with gosh, it. that would be the best. So yeah, yeah, but you'd be surprised. Like you can usually, it, there's usually a change in the cartilage at the cam lesion. The, the weight bearing cartilage that's all spherical is healthy and then it just it really starts to transition you'll see this like tidal zone or transition zone where it starts to get pretty poor at that area so there are a lot of key things but sometimes you'll get that patient who has some degenerative changes but they're super athletic and they they really want to try to save the joint and you'll see that transition it can it, sometimes it can be hard so a hundred years from now and we're not here obviously anymore what's different i mean like i feel like the tommy john surgery is really you know you know, we've really perfected that and it's really yeah. doing well. And then there's other surgeries that, you know, you were talking about today, like the, um, the hip isn't necessarily the hip replacements, not quite where the knee is and, and things like that. So, and the ankle sure as hell not where okay. the, yeah. yeah. No. But, um, so where do, yeah. where do you think it's all like, what, what's the next 20 years look like in this world? So I think there's a couple things. So first of all, my indications for arthroscopic surgery actually get tighter yeah. every year. So there's, there's more and more patients every year that I say, you're not the right candidate. You're going to be unhappy with this. This is not what you right. need, right? And some of those need an osteotomy of the femur to change their version. Hmm. Um, some of them need the impingement stuff. Some of them need a psychiatrist. Um, Preach. We got a stable. <laughs> but, but no, no, no. But no, in all seriousness, though, um, I think the biggest change. Well, first of all, I have zero problems recommending a replacement when that's the answer i mean our our lives are trying to avoid hip replacements and that's the mentality of most of our patients you know but when for the right patient it's the right thing to do but what i think is going to really change with your question was with the next hundred years i think we are going to be doing prophylactic surgery Mm. I think we are going to be identifying these It kind kids. of makes sense. No one wants to say it because that's not they like a, it's kind no, of an uncomfortable no. And you're going to, yeah, it's one of those things. It's one of those things in our closed rooms with my colleagues and no one else is around listening to it. No one's got a podcast that can yeah, right. never leave the internet. You're damn right we talk about that. Right. Mm-hmm. You're, you're talking, you're talk, I talk, a 16 year old goalie who's lost 25% of his cartilage because of this giant cam lesion. Yeah. Why would How you on earth that? would you not consider on the other side? Taking, getting rid of that. Or at least if it was my son. Yeah. So here's, here's, here's what I always do. I, I have five kids. Uh, I actually like all five. I really like all five. Yes. <laughs> no, you, no, you're no, you're lying. You have a right favorite. Who's a favorite? Yeah, who's a favorite? You have a right favorite. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on the day, right? It changes the day. Yeah, yeah. No, but I always, I, I like that with, you know, so what are you supposed to do in 2021, 2022? You're supposed to give patients their options, risk benefits, complications, and, and let them, you know, take that information, digest it, and make a decision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Iron cross it. No, you're supposed to give them all that stuff. Then you're supposed to kind of give them the little bit of tweak, 
And then my, you know, if it's, if it's, if we've developed the right rapport with the patients and their parents and stuff, here's what I do with my child. Here's what I would do with my kid, you know, and that's it. And, it, and I'm telling you, if, if that 16 year old goalie, I showed the video on today of that cartilage injury, six weeks later, his other hip would be having camera section. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. If it was my child, right? Mm -hmm. no questions asked. Like we've seen it all. Gon saw it. That's why. That's why he figured out FAI was he saw thirty year olds getting hip replacements. Why are they doing this? Massive camel lesions. So. Hmm. Now we're we're really fortunate here in St. Louis. So we have. Uh, I mean, we've talked about Philippon. We talked about Bird. We know uh, Shane No and, and Rush. Um, so how do like our listeners because they're scattered all over the world? How do you find? these top people in this field that way they're not at some hack that doesn't know what they're doing yeah so i i mean we haven't done that but i mean well let's put together a network that you need to do that i mean yeah, that would be yeah so i think i think that's that's really what we need to do right and now you know my, our, my practice in st louis motion orthopedics is now affiliated with stem and hawkins clinic and mark philippon in colorado we actually we're actually in business together um so it th this is Kind of one of the benefits of that is now shared collectives, you know, mm -hmm. brain power and finding the disciples that are at the different areas so that you can get similar mentality. Is there a collaboration between uh, Philippon and Bird? Are they? Um, not a, not, I mean, not a formal. I mean, I think there's that, there's respect that, and yeah, academic collegial respect. And I mean, I've got them all. John Christopheretti, who's in Frisco, you know, Texas. Andy Wolf, who's in 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 uh, Virginia. I mean, we've got them. They're all over the place. Right. I mean, yeah. If we look at like Tommy John surgery, for example, there's like different uh, opinions. For example, do we move the ulnar nerve? Things like that. Is there different opinions in thermos head bear impingement labral surgeries, or is it all kind of we're doing the same thing? No, I mean I, things have morphed. We talked today about you know Brian Kelly in New York who did who was that was a great was, story. Yeah, was, the humbleness was I amazing. Mean, Brian's just the like sort of a one-of-a-kind dude but in, in all sorts of ways just i mean are you you guys need to go see him he Set would, it up. He, right. this would, you go with us oh he would just i mean he, he and i know each other just That'd be so much fun barely we're not super close but but he uh, close, though. but he's just in it but he did the study where he he was he was lengthening the hip flexor the iliopsoas in dancers and it turned out to be not a great thing you know and he 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 said, you know what? He admitted he owned up to it, which is That's rare. The right thing to do for patients is to kind of, is to kind of let them know there. So, 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 you know, they're, they're pendulums. You know, we were, we were lengthening a lot of hip flexors back in 2008 and nine. We're not, I don't touch it now unless it's, unless I got to debulk some prior tear or something like that. Um, so yeah, they're not all the, it's, it's not a cookie cutter type thing, but, right? but the collective energy amongst the young guys that do this procedure is pretty strong. And right. I think we talk a lot. We're willing to share our our, our disasters. Well, you'd have to be a little bit of an artist too, I'm assuming, because you're you're reshaping, right? So you gotta you gotta kind of like you know visualize. I'm assuming in your mind like what this needs to look like, and uh, so there's an artistic uh, ability to what we're what we're talking about. It was interesting. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I'm a barbarian. I'm an animal. I'm a you know, I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a carpenter, that, yes, you know, yeah. with, with, with nicer tools. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. uh, more no, there, there's, more there's, there's a, I, I actually, I would, I would actually describe it a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, when you're shaving the impingement or you're reshaping the head, there's some, there, I mean, there's some physical dexterity component to it, but I would say it's more diligence. Right. It's diligence. It's staying on it. We use real time x-ray fluoroscopy in the time of surgery and just like, Making sure you, I don't care how long your day takes, you know, I mean, and it, it's not about a schedule or time. It's, it's, I have to remove this impingement lesion. Otherwise it's coming back, you know? Mm. So I think it's more diligence. Everything In happens. our world, we talk about like the ability, I always use the example of Bobby Fisher, the chess player, like yeah. the pattern recognition and like. Most people who do like what the three of us do, like they're not paying attention their day. Therefore, they're not like getting exponentially better, you know. So do you think in your career, you said you're 46, I'm 44. Um, like every day, like you just continue to get better at what you're doing. How would you describe that process? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's something to be said just about experience and, and, it, and, and, when, and I do try to push myself. So somebody asked today, you know, how many, how many x-ray pictures do you take? 
during your, your surgeries, you know, and I wear lead and all this stuff, but I'm, I'm actually really bad about protecting my hands. And so when you're, if you're marking the lesion, I mean, I, I'm great now. <laughs> when I had Good a second, when I had a sign of cancer. When, yeah. I, when, I, when, I, when I had a, <laughs> Hopefully my insurance is this. <laughs> it was a good ride, bro. Yeah, it was a good ride. Peace, y'all. There's lesions over here. Um, no, the, the, the concept was, is how do, we, how do we x-ray less? How do we get less radiation in the room? So, so I really, it's a game for me to, to try to get the camera section perfect before I take an x-ray. Mm. Game I want to take, I mean, take, like the- take two x-rays. Actually, I want to take, take three pictures. I want to take when we're done with surgery. They're in a traction system. I want to take a. I want to take straight. I want to take flex, and I want to take neutral, and I want them to be perfect. Mm. And if I can get that, you know, that's the that's the ultimate. It is, I don't have to go back and do anything else. You know, so so we. I spend more time on that. I really look at different areas there. But you know, it's a game, man. So you, it's not a game. It's not a game at all. <laughs> it but is. It's, it's, it's an art, though. But but listen, here's the thing. Here's yeah. the thing. Look at all it. Cardiac surgery, doesn't matter what it is. My goal is to be as efficient as possible because the less time they're under anesthesia, the better. Right. Mm-hmm. The longer they're under general, you, we, we can't do this on a block. It just doesn't work. We tried to use all sorts of different blocks and it's just pulling traction on the hip. It's just brutal. So, mm-hmm. so you're asleep for the procedure. So, you know, we want to be super efficient. So I, do, I definitely use x-ray to help get it right and go f- quickly or efficiently, but... One thing, but there's uh, a game, there's a we I challenge ourselves all the time. Yeah, you know? yeah. I could tell something you're passionate about right now as we were texting, getting ready for this. You were uh, you asked to talk about the glute medius oh, tear. Yeah. So that's something that you know you know we do doctors meetings here every week, and that's something we've definitely never. Ta- I mean, you, of course, you see it commented on the MRI, but as far as that being the patient's pain generator, we've definitely probably uh, underappreciated that. So could you speak on kind of what you were yeah. talking about there? Yeah. Well, I mean, anybody who's in this audience is going to know the, the, the running IT band knee issue, you know? Sure. So you got a gal gets challenged by her friends and says, I'm going to run a, we're going to run a, we're going to train together. We're going to do this half marathon. It's going to be amazing. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. the, the, most of my exercise was going to the fridge for, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you know, and now we're going to run. So you do a lateral release procedure. Yeah, everybody does it. So the classic, you know, so you're, you're training, you're training, you're training, you're running, you're running, you're running, you're getting quad dominant, maybe a little bit of hamstring stuff. You're never focused on your glutes. You just run, 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 run. They fatigue, they're weak. You get the IT band pressure. You get your knee stuff. I mean, just it's just a train wreck, right? So um, I actually, look, I talked about glute meat tears today to fix. But I would say probably nine out of ten patients that come into my office with with lateral hip pain, it's weak glute med. They just need to strengthen it. Yeah, mm-hmm. oh, I agree. Sure. But without a doubt, you know, throw the knee in there. Too. There's a lot of other stuff. Yeah, well, it fixes your knee pain, fixes yeah. everything, right? It's just and it and it's not about just strength. It's not about bench strength. It's about endurance. Mm-hmm. Where are you an hour later? Where are you two hours later? Where are you at the end of the day if you're a nurse? I mean, some nurses in the big hospitals they'll walk. 10 miles a day, you know what right. I mean? Yeah, why does your knee hurt at the end of the day? Because you have no glute endurance or weakness. Mm-hmm. But what I'm most blown away by in my in this world, um, there are plenty of rock stars. In the Cairo world or the, or, the, or, the, or the physical therapy rehab world. But it's unbelievable how many people come in and they've been doing glute abductor exercises and they're just building the lateral vastus and <laughs> right. their TFL because they're, yeah. they're cheating yeah. the whole time and you're, yeah. you're like no one isolated you and showed you how to do this exercise you know so so that's a huge thing you know but if if you're if 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 you know if somebody watching this or listening to this podcast is is you know die hard glute meat strengtheners and it's failing to work get an MRI right. check it out you know, that high grade, that's what I see. You know, I get, I'll get the text from a, from a rock star, you know, PT or Cairo and they'll be like, dude, I've thrown everything in the kitchen sink at this glued mead and I can't get strength. Okay. In the mechanisms, degenerative, I'm assuming. Yes. Like, yeah. Yes. I mean, blue moon, we get a fall, but no, they're, it's, the falls are easy because they go from being normal to not normal. To not normal and, and the. No, but almost all of them are just attritional over time and degenerative. Yeah, so and I'm assuming there's, there's a role for biologics. I think we talked about that today too. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. For part, if you can catch them in an early phase where they've got some, they've got enough tendon tissue and there's some healing potential, 
I think platelet rich plasma and some of the biologic options are great for that. But when they get when it gets when it you know when it hits that eighty percent of the t- of the tenant, it ain't working anymore. I think you said fifty percent was kind of your rule, right? Like this today, or was that not? Well, no. I mean, I, I said. I, well, I said I think if it's less than fifty percent or it's contained, PRP works great. Yeah, in my world. Yeah, right. Fifty um, percent tear doesn't mean it needs to be repaired by any means, but. But when I see more than 50%, that's when I start to see them fall apart and, and they're not working with our traditional techniques. Yet. Sure. Is a plain film MR fine for that? Fine. Perfect. In fact, that's one of the hard parts. So I, a lot of radiologists would say I'd rather have a plain film if I'm really looking for glute meat pathology, mm. you know, because mm-hmm. the GAD doesn't kind of get in the way. Or if you shoot it full of dye too, then you lose the ability to see whether or not there's a fusion in the joint, you know, like mm-hmm. so... You know, mm-hmm. might help you in your differential diagnosis potentially. Yeah. I think in the next five years, I think in the next five years we'll be almost arthrogram free. So if we all That's order an MRI right. without contrast and you see one of our patients, you're not looking at us like, what a stooge, I didn't get an arthrogram. You're, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. Right. Not at all. Because usually by the time we're ordering imaging, we're thinking, no, that was, that was, this the, is going, that yeah. was the mentality 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It really was that mentality. No. Okay. I mean, I mean, if it's a good, if, if it's a good diagnostic quality, if it's a quality MRI, um, you should be able to see enough and we're going to stack that diagnostic test. Sure. Injection onto it. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is huge even for the cost of treatment. You know, like oh, if you don't yeah. have to do an arthrogram, you don't have to have a... Well, the, yeah, misery, of get, the misery of getting your hip injected, all oh, that stuff. You just, just it's take a nightmare. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, nightmare. Yeah. What does it tell you? You know, sometimes you get those patients who are actually like, oh my God, after I got my patient filled with, the, my hip feels great. What does that tell you about the case? Well, that was a diagnostic. That right. Was it. They got their diagnostic injection. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So just just further evidence that that's, that's you're, the, you're dealing uh, with what you think right. you're dealing with. Yeah. If I'm hearing you right, too, one of the ways of maybe uh, weeding out a, a good hip surgeon would maybe be if they're willing to do a diagnostic injection in the right manner, not yeah. corticosteroids and uh, in, yeah. in the slidocaine. Well, that was refreshing too because to be honest, like I would never want to burden Dave King with like stuff that I wasn't sure about, like. Is a you know what I'm always trying to do for the our orthopedic referrals is like I don't want you dealing with chronic yeah. pain I don't want you dealing with stuff that um, and I think that's a, a mistake sometimes like with chiros and PTs like they're like well I want a second opinion I'm like yeah but you're filling their schedule with a bunch of stuff they don't want so but what you said today was really fascinating you said you actually don't mind doing that I'm sure you don't want to have a you know thirty those day, patients yeah. in a day but you don't mind going through your little. Uh, uh, ultrasound with an injection to yeah. kind of see, you know, like no. you're, you're okay with that. No, no, no. I mean, it, you know, listen, if, if it's not a, if they're not really a psychiatric referral <laughs> and they're really, we're trying to just differentiate these pain profiles, it's great. I mean, that's what we do and we're really excited for it. And, and there is no problem, you know, ruling out a joint related issue and then passing it back to say, Hey, you know what? This is just a confusing case, but yeah, hey, it's not the joint. We're Keep good. Keep going. Yeah. yeah, there's a little, a little small labral tear on the MRI, but it's it's that's not the source of their pain. Right. Not a, not an issue. Don't need to fix that. That's good. Um, uh, that's there's so not, there's good. no major cam impingement. There's no hip dysplasia. Like let's just keep firing at it, you know. And um, no, that's 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 who we see all the time, anyways. And yeah, we love that's doing awesome. that because that's how it works, and that's how you get a better. That's how you get a better flow. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's at the end of the day, that's what we all want out of healthcare is multiple people saying the same thing. Yeah. You know, like, cause if we're struggling with the patient, we got it. It's nothing more reassuring than you saying, keep going, you know, like keep going no different than you saying, nope, this is mine. Mm-hmm. Take it. You know? And so I think that's, that's a refreshing. The other thing, thing I can do too for you guys too, is I, I have a, I have, I'm such an asshole when it comes to their kind of workouts. Like I really, I'll sit down and we'll spend 10 minutes just going through what, tell me about your workouts. Mm. Tell me what you're really doing today. You know, and I, and I, I see somebody with a 3% body fat, you know, and every vein I can see everywhere. And I'm like, well, let's, let's call it, let's call your significant other. And, <laughs> yeah. <"Let's hear> <laughs> Be careful with that. <laughs> you know, some, sometimes you get in, you know, it's sometimes, sometimes you get into it and you're just like, can we just can we reboot a couple of things? Can we can we add a rest day? Can we do this kind of stuff there? You know. Mm-hmm. So I think you made a good point too about uh, we talked about stress fractures a little bit, mm-hmm. and so um, you you said in the last year you've gone more into the metabolic side and more into uh, maybe the the psychological side. So maybe could you, you speak on that? Yeah, well, it's more of the I mean, it's more of the biological side, mm-hmm. you know. But it's really you know it's it's that big pendulum, you know. I mean the it's um, 
you know, eating disorders, exercise induced issues, you know, and there's, and there's this pendulum was like, well, we don't want to talk about it because mm-hmm. we might, you know, do stuff mm-hmm. or say, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm not going to offend you or that kind of stuff. And, and you know, and my thing is, <clears throat> I mean, this is a multi, you know, multidisciplinary approach to taking care of a patient. The patient has to be all in too. Sure. You know? and, and you think if you walk into my office and tell me, you, you know, you have an eating disorder and you haven't had a period in nine months, like I'm going to judge you over that? Like, oh. Yeah, I'm here to help you. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. But we're on a team. But I need to know that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And let me, you know, and I actually have some, you know, we have some contacts that are that are amazing specialists in in helping with that. They're not local. They do tele, but mm-hmm. um, they work through people with these issues. You know, and they affect like, your hey, pain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, but we can't, we can't, we can't put our heads in the sand. You know, but I haven't seen a stress fracture. I haven't seen a stress fracture in the last twelve months. Where somebody doesn't have some component of that, right? Mm. Most of the time, now most of the time, it's actually just exercise induced. Sure, you know, too much. They're they're yeah. they're 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 working out healthy. They eat like the right stuff. Maybe not enough calories. Maybe not out of this. They're not really in sort of any sort of sort of awful place. It's just it's imbalance. It's just awful. It's just bit, something yeah. off, you yeah. know. And, and and that's the majority of what I actually see. You right. Know? Maybe to wrap this up, Dave. I, I think a lot of chiropractors physical therapists, they're a little bit intimidated to reach out to orthopedic surgeons or, you know, they're, they're intimidated to make those connections. You, you made a point today that for you, you just rather have a text message. Text That's message. your favorite. But what about maybe, uh, I don't know, you, you, not all orthopedic surgeons are like that or not all MDs are like that. What, what's the best way or what, what advice do you have for us to reach out to you or to make that connection? Um, well, I think, I think if asking somebody, Hey, I'd like to send you patients. Uh, do you just want me to send them and you, you know, do, you, do you want a little update? I mean, everybody's going to have a little different. It can get too cumbersome. But if you have something like the hip where you don't, there's not a ton of. Is it the hip or not? <laughs> yeah. If you, there's not a ton of people that you're referring to for, right. for, for to a surgeon for it. Yeah, just ask that, you know, ask them. Most mm-hmm. of us just kind of want to be asked. Some guys may say, and I think this is fine too. I have a lot of people. It's not me. I mean, you can reach out to me directly. But a lot of guys might say, hey, you know what? My PA is a rock star. Mm. To, you know, and in fact, they might actually even be better on the day-to-day clinical side of things. Get to you know? know him or her. Yeah, and, yeah. like like communicate with them. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I get no less than thirty texts a day from either PTs, chiros, or other docs in town. My PAs probably get thirty to forty themselves <laughs> every day. You know, I, I think we're probably on a hundred text messages. Hey, so and so's coming. You know. Physical therapy, the dirty world of physical therapy, is you got to, Some of your notes have to, are for billing purposes, right? And the and, and, the, and the real information yeah. is just brutally buried in nowhere. And I can I look at them, I just light them on fire. It's kindling, you know. But I want to know what they think. Yeah, mm-hmm. I really want to. You know, I wish every. I wish all the therapy notes had like a bold at the top that was like, "Tell me what you think." Mm. You know. Maybe even that gets knocked off when it goes to the billing people there. But just, just where are you? Are they, are they, are they doing better? Are they not? What are you seeing functionally? Like, what you're seeing is so important. But what I think happens a lot of times with guys, you know, I'm seeing 60, 70 patients on a Thursday, and I pull up a note and I crumble it up. And the ther- you know, the, the thought is like the therapist saying, "Well, that that doc's an asshole. He doesn't like. He doesn't care what I think. No, I, I absolutely really care what you think." Just tell me what I need to know. Don't have the time sense. to work through all that yeah. bullshit. Yeah, I got it. And I get those texts. I get the same day. Hey, so and so's coming in, killing it. I, they're going to be. They're right on target. Done. I mean, brilliant. Yeah. I don't even need to look at the PT note. Sorry. Oh no, I have a self-serving question to ask you. So this is if you're not from St. Louis, which is a lot of people actually, this uh, doesn't pertain to you. But you mentioned uh, Cole Hissy. So I, you, you say St. Louis hip, and you, you you hear the name David King, and you hear Cole Hissy, like. For us, like, who do we like? What would be a reason to send to him yeah, versus yeah, yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. So, so John Cloisey was one of my you know mentors at at Washu. I mean, I I I, I don't think in the Midwest there is a better dysplasia specialist. So hip dysplasia, real, real bone dysplasia where your socket never Shallow, formed correctly, yeah. right? And there's, I mean, obviously there's huge variations of that. There can be borderline, but when you have a really shallow hip socket and it's it's clear. He's the guy. I mean, the guy, they, you know, you don't want to do it, but they work, if you need it, it they work unbelievably well to turn the pelvis to create a PAO or a yeah. periacetabular osteotomy 
for the right individual and he's mastered the thing. He's mastered it technically. He knows who's going to benefit from it, who won't benefit from it. You know, I mean, I'll send patients sometime down and I'll, they'll be on borderline and I'll be like, uh, you know, they're, they're 17 years old. This, you know, this is the rest of their life. I think they'll do well with the hip scope and, but their numbers are just kind of right on the cusp. Yeah. And you know, and, Look, they'll see him. They'll see him, and he'll say, "Yep, PAO." Or he'll be like, "No, the scope's the right answer." And you know, and they come back, and they go, "Yep, he's he's good." I, I we're not that place. He's he does the he does the version osteotomies, mm. you know, and and he can do the arthroscopic portion if you need it with those procedures. But yeah, that's who that's who you send there. Perfect. Um, at the same time, I don't mind seeing them either because Madeline, his main go-to kind of assistant. We've got the direct communication line with. So, right. Yeah. You know, so if you call us, so if you call his office, they're going to screen all your stuff. They're going to do all of this. It's going to take nine months. You know, when we can give them, here are their angles. Here are the measurements. Here's what they've done. You know, and this is this this patient needs to be seen for a osteotomy. It just changes the whole oh, situation. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So maybe let's end with uh, this has been an awesome conversation, but. What what are maybe the one or two intangibles, Dave, that make you who you are? I mean, like, we, you know, it's always fun for us to sit down and we drink some wine. We talk about just some awesome stuff. But, like, you, you know, we kind of had a conversation off air about what makes you such a good surgeon. And you had some really good answers. But I'm just curious, like, what are the two or three maybe intangibles that you, you think have put you in the position to be an expert in this field and that, that you are so passionate about? And, and that no one ever talks about. Right. right? I mean, we don't, like, we don't want the fluff stuff. Like, oh, I just love doing this. No. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the reason we say that is because we're, we're trying to build the top 10% of, of manual therapists in the world. Yeah. Right? And we, we want to learn lessons from everybody. We want to learn lessons, the things that make you special, the things that make Brett special, the things that make all these people special. Yeah. Well, so first of all is exactly, exactly the point of that is I appreciate what I might not know or don't know. You know, mm. so, so the, so, you know, I tell patients all the time, I'm like, listen, you know, having a great surgeon do your surgery is probably 35 to 60 to 40 percent of your deal the rest of it is what we do after that you know mm. so so to, to think that it's an isolated you know experience is just moronic you know mm. so mm. i think that's part of it the other thing too is 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 it's you know it's a fault but i think it's it's who i am you know i'm swearing on your podcast and 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 having a glass of wine you know <laughs> You're, we're, we're people and we're humans together and, and, and you, this is your, this is their, my patient's experience and we got to connect. Mm. And if we don't have, if we don't have a real open line of communication, you know I mean? You know, we get into it. I get into it. I fight with patients. We fight yeah. in a good, in a constructive way, yeah. you know, like I'm all in, you know, there's tears, there's, you know, we, we, mm -hmm. we have a lot of these real things, you know, I mean, yeah, I've got a great training background I'm very definitive in what I do. You know, I, I process information very quickly and I make a strong decision, which is important. Um, but, you know, I mean, I had a patient, I, I'll tell you just a story here. So yeah. a guy, he's a police officer and he, uh, he was sent to me because he injured his shoulder recently and I had to fix his rotator cuff, right? So I'm, I'm just, I know, I know this guy. Right, and I'm like, God, I don't know how I know this guy, but I know this guy somehow. And I'm searching his last name. I'm doing all this kind of stuff. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. Anyways, we the day of surgery, he's sitting there, he's looking at me at the thing. He goes, he goes, you don't remember my wife and my daughter, do you? And I'm like, nope, I uh, I just didn't put that together, you know. And sure, he's he's like, yeah, five years ago, my daughter was, you know, in competitive cheer, dance, the whole deal. She had a small labral tear. My wife brought her to you for surgery, you know, and you, over three visits, basically, essentially refused to operate on her. You, you know, bullied my wife to quit the dance studio and you, you know, they were, my wife hated you. My daughter was in tears. Um, everybody told him to see you. She's like, she's like, I quit the dance studio. I kept dancing for my school. My hip pain completely went away. 
you know, I got into some other things and I just kind of opened my life up like dance is not life, you know? Yeah. Mm. And I got, in, I got my identity and, and he's like, and she's like, I have zero hip pain, never had surgery, never had anything. And, he, and it was just like, he's like, wow. he's like, you just stood your ground and you, I mean, it would have been very simple for me to just go in and put an anchor in her labrum and I would have. I would have taken her out of dancing for six months anyway. She would have done wonderfully. Right. right. And, and I would have gotten the credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I would have said, oh, Dr. King said, oh, yeah. Oh, you know, she's a senior, you know, she was going to miss, miss her senior year, the whole thing there. And it was like, what? You know, I, I'll, go, I'll go to war with you if it's the right thing for your kid, you know? Wow, that's, so that's awesome. powerful. Anyways. That's so awesome. Very powerful. <laughs> Well, what, what, what a great conversation. I think uh, we can take a lot from this. And, you know, at the end of the day, multidisciplinary, you know, you said it, you love multidisciplinary. We love multidisciplinary. We love talking to people about this stuff. And we're really just trying to change the the vision and the uh, the direction of, multi, uh, of musculoskeletal health in general. And I know mm-hmm. that you're doing the same way. And so uh, we're, we're lucky to have you in St. Louis. We're, we got to get you out here more If you're often, not, so. I still tell other people who aren't from St. Louis to come see Dave King. Yes. And stuff, oh, so. yeah. I'm just yeah, anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. We, we'd love Thanks to. Thanks for having me. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. All right. And cheers. Is there any more left? Oh, yeah. heck yeah. <laughs> we got some more. We'll have a little bit off air. Yeah, we'll let's let's, football, yeah, yeah, let's okay. shut down the damn. sign off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, uh, reach back out to us. Uh, man, Rick King, thanks, brother. Appreciate thanks, brother. it. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was if anybody, awesome. If anybody yeah. who's watching this needs my info, you can have my email, my cell, anytime. Awesome. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll hook them up with it. All right, guys. Have a good day. Good luck with patience. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it. Subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.